thank uh, our speakers. Uh, Jackie is coming, so that's, uh, that's a good news. Uh, hello, Jackie. We don't hear you, but it's not your turn, so that's fine. Uh, you you will be uh, as uh, as it was uh, written on the on the website. We will be the third to speak, and so we will have four presentation, twenty minutes uh, each presentation, and five minutes uh, uh, questions. Uh, so I'm kind of asking you to to respect the the timing, uh, and so um, Alanda from. Uh, Alenda Venter from the University of Pretoria will start the, the presentation. So the session is dedicated to institutions for energy. So let's say it's very large, very broad. We will hear very different uh, in, uh, role for institutions, the very different institution, different countries, but it all deals with energy. That's the, that's the common uh, uh, common topic. So thank you all, and uh, I leave the floor to to Alanda uh, to present us uh, her paper uh, co-written with Rula um, Inglesi Lot on the, the impact of institutions on the energy supply markets. So uh, Alanda, the floor is yours for twenty minutes. Hi everyone. Um, can you all see my slides? Yes, that's perfect. So the paper that I will be presenting today is the impact of institutions on the energy supply capacity. Um, just, there we go. Okay, so energy availability and generation have significant impacts on economies and therefore it's important for us to understand which factors affect the energy sector. It would be imperative for us towards attaining a sustainable energy transition, as well as giving access for all to energy using, um, sorry, towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So energy sectors can be affected by many factors, such as institutional quality. And this study looks at how institutional quality affects the electricity generation capacity within the energy sector. We use different markets and supplies mixes to propose a holistic policy suggestion. As Aisman Glue Johnson and Robinson in their 2005, 2005 paper indicated, economic institutions is of primary concern to economic outcomes. And they also influence the society structures as well as the allocation of resources. Now, uh, better quality institutions allow for better uh, allocation to resources. Ashma Glue, Johnson and Robertson also indicated that economies usually strive where in institutions um, encourage factor accumulation, innovation and efficient allocation of resources. Where institutions inefficiently allocate resources within the energy sector, we've seen that energy capacity shortages can occur and this can hurt the economy. So in this study, um, we use H. Glue's 2003 institutions definition is a, as a, it is a cluster of social arrangements that includes constitutional and social limits on politicians and elites power, the rule of law, as well as strong property rights and enforcement. Now, the purpose of this study is to estimate, examine and compare the, the impacts of various institutional factors on the electricity generation capacity. And it's done on 20 countries that is selected IEA countries along with Chile, Colombia and Israel. It's done on the time period from 2003 to 2018 and it uses a panel data set. We look at how quality institutions affect the stability of market in turn affecting the energy gener electricity generation capacity. Now, this study will help provide results to provide inso insights for policymakers to improve certain institutional factors, along with organizations in the electricity generation sector to ensure reliable and sustainable electricity supply for the future. Now, as literature reviews concerned, Ashma Glue Johnson and Robinson have indicated that political powers cannot choose uh, um, resources efficiently because of their conflicts of interest and this affects the institutions in our economy. And the two main reasons they give for inefficient in 
institutions is the failure to commit by political powers. They struggle to secure property rights and law enforcement in the long run. And the second reason is political losers because the elite desire to pr protect their political power and their political power provides them with income, rent and privileges. When their political power declines, then their income, rent and privileges also decline. So the energy sector, as we know, is a target for corruption. And this is mainly because of the availability of resources, the large oversight that government has, as well as rent seeking possibilities. Okay, so the data and methodology in this paper is we usually we had 10 institutional variables of which we chose six from a correlation matrix and a dependent variable is the electricity generation capacity the control va variables is gdp price of electricity electricity consumption population and financial development and then the institutional variables is property right corruption perception, voice and accountability, government efficiency, rule of law, and regulatory quality. The data sources that we used was World Government Indicators, Transparency International, Economic Freedom Index, the IEA, OECD database, and the World Development Indicators. Now, as you guys can see, we used five models, of which model D was our final model, it was the one that is the most robust. Now, EG is our dependent variable, the electricity generation, uh, uh, generation capacity. And then X represents the institutional variable. So for each model, we just added the control variable. So you'd see in model A, the control variable is GDP. In model B, it's we add price of electricity. And in model C, we add electricity consumption. Model D, we add population. And in model E, we added financial development. So when we come to the result, uh, and we used an SUR model to compute the results. So the results tells us for property rights that 10 countries will experience an insignificant effect on their electricity generation capacity, while eight countries would experience a negative yet significant effect on their electricity generation capacity. Now, when I say negative, just explain the electricity generation capacity would decrease as their um, property rights quality institution increases. And this is because of high quality institutions leads to higher social wealth and efficiency. So we have improved quality, which leads to improved efficiency, more innovation, improved technology and industrial development. So there's an efficiency gain and we need less capacity to produce. Now, as Kumar in his 2003 paper explained in the early days, of a country's development, uh, property rights is a lot less strict than later in the process of development. Because when they're in the process of development at later stages, then they become large producers of innovation and new technologies. And therefore, property rights need to become more strict. So here we can see um, Chile, Colombia, Czech Republic, Israel, Italy, Japan, Poland, and Spain will um, experience a decrease in their electricity generation capacity when property rights increase. And the rest of the countries are uh, will have the insignificant effect. Austria is not included here. We unfortunately have Austria in their index for property rights has a very similar uh, in a number each year for, for their data, and it caused high correlation, but it's only for property rights run separately. Then um, next is the corruption perception. And before I talk about the results, I would just like to mention that a higher perception score means that less co corruption is perceived. So for four countries, if the corruption perception score increases, it would decrease the electricity generation capacity and it's significant. So this, uh, this causes stabilization in markets because there is less corruption now. 
And then for seven countries, it means that there will be an increase and it would be significant in the electricity generation uh, the, yeah, the electricity generation capacity. And this is mainly again because of the stabilizing in stabilization in markets, increase the capacity as well as investors will now tend to invest more because corruption perception is, is less. Nine, in, uh, nine countries tend to be insignificant the effect on electricity generation capacity. And now we can see which countries are. So Australia, Colombia, France, Ireland, SA, Spain, and the UK will, will be the countries that experience an increase in their electricity generation capacity when corruption per perception increases, while Chile, Japan, Poland, and Portugal will experience a decrease in their electricity generation capacity with an increase in corruption perception. Okay, next, um, accountability has helped us with um, ass assisting with environmental, social, and governmental issues. It also helps with efficiency gains, market structure, and again, once again, the institutional quality increases. So the 10 countries, uh, um, there's 10 countries that uh, the electricity generation capacity will occur in uh, insignificant effect when voice and accountability quality increases. While five countries, um, electricity generation capacity would increase and um, five countries electricity generation capacity would decrease both significant. If we look now, this would be Austria, Colombia, Germany, Greece, and Spain would experience an increase in their electricity generation capacity with the quality increase in this institution, while Ireland, Israel, Japan, and Poland, as well as SA, would experience a decrease in their electricity generation capacity. Okay, so next is a government efficiency, and it can be defined as the quality of services yielded to the public. Now, generally, pressure is put on the government for public funds to be spent in such a way on successful projects. Um, if they spend on successful projects, usually this increases the gain and um, as well as the market stability. Okay, so for four countries, we have a positive and significant effect. And then for six countries, we have a negative and significant effect, as well as then for 10 countries, it won't be, uh, have an effect on. So we can see here that France, Greece, Israel, Italy, and Italy are the four countries that experience an increase in their electricity generation capacity when government efficiency increases, while Austria, Czech Republic, Hungary, Ireland, Poland, and the UK would decrease the electricity generation capacity when government efficiency increases. Okay. So quality of legal systems can affect the equity and resource allocation. So a more effective legal system has good governments, it decreases corruption, as well as more effective resource allocation again. So eight countries, um, will experience a negative and significant impact on their electricity generation capacity, while two countries a positive and significant impact. Here we have again 10 countries that would be in, experience an insignificant impact. From here, Greece and Spain, the electricity generation capacity would, be, would have an increase when rule of law quality increases, while Australia, Austria, Chile, Ireland, Italy, Mexico, Poland, and SA will experience a decrease in their electricity generation capacity. And this is mainly again because of the efficiency gain. Uh, I just want to move this. It's, sorry, there we go. Um, it's Okay, so um, we can look at regulatory quality as how effective governments promote the private sector development. And in this instance, sometimes they give production to them, but would interfere when large market failures occur. So five countries have a positive and significant impact, while seven countries have a negative and significant impact, eight countries insignificant impact. So Greece, Hungary, uh, Israel, Japan, and Spain 
will have a positive and significant increase in their electricity generation capacity. Well, Australia, Germany, Poland, Portugal, SA, UK, and US will have a, will have a decrease in their electricity generation capacity. Okay, so overall, no patterns were found to predict which countries will be affected by a certain type of institution, but at least 10 countries were affected by each institution. Institutional quality affects the market structure, the mar and this in turn affects the stabilization of markets just in short, and it can increase or decrease the effectiveness of the electricity generation capacity, as we've seen. Okay. So efficient institutions can make a, a better functioning market. However, inefficient institutions can increase the costs in market, hindering the market activity. Uh, policy recommendations, when countries are looking at which institutions they need to prioritize um, to, in, to improve their electricity generation capacity, they should take into account the credibility and stability of each institution, as long as the, uh, uh, along the severity of the impact the institution has on the electricity generation, and consider whether the policy effects st uh, um, stabilize the market or not. Policies should also assist institutions in integrating with each other, such as if the rule of law is improved, it can decrease corruption. So the effect of institutional factors, which effect they have on electricity generation capacity should also be taken into account. And then lastly, institutional progress can assist with a sustainable transition forward. So institutions play a valid role there. Thank you. Uh, Thank just... you very much, uh, Ananda. Um, so we can now uh, switch to question. You, uh, you, you took uh, 50 minutes. So is there any question? Yes, please, Jackie. Yeah, thanks so much for that. It was very interesting. One, one of the things, though, that I find is that we use the word um, electricity generation capacity because to my mind i'm thinking megawatts mm. so every time i hear the word capacity or or then i'm thinking knowledge base right as in the human mm. capacity and the amount of funding that the regulators have for that so those are the two like my mental boxes that it goes that it goes into so so when i heard the term generation capacity could you explain to me what you what you mean by that term so that i can better understand the so the we, results? we we use the it in terawatt hours, and the amount that they there um, can produce the the pro uh, production limit. Okay, so okay. it's so it's so it's, it's it's how much has been invested. It it, it is the... it's the production amount. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's the the the, the energy to the total amount of energy that's generated, as opposed to the capacity uh, of the system. To this paper specifically. It would be the electricity. I, I know it comes within the energy sector, but just specifically to the el electricity amount. But it's not installed capacity, it's it's electricity generated. Yeah. Okay. And so and so the the thrust then, if that's what you're measuring, the amount of electricity generated, you're saying that if you have if you don't have if you have weak um institutions then they're not going to have as much invested in electricity generation yeah essentially in, it's, it's not um poor institutions will drive investors away and if you look at developing countries they need investors for large infrastructure projects but large infrastructure projects as literature has shown indicates that it is quite susceptible to large bribes so yeah, they, I think it's just a matter of the confidence of investors. It's not with weak institutions. But how do you control um, for the need for capacity? I mean, in, in each country, because uh, in some country, there doesn't need to be new investment. Well, it can improve, right? So we can get efficiency gains because sometimes we might shut down an old power plant and get some new technology in. 
and maybe there needs to be some investment. It's not solely based on investment. This is just an example, but um, so say, say we're at a limit capacity where we don't need to install any extras, but we can make some efficiency changes where we can spare um, the environment, then definitely a better institution would make, uh, would make a change. So, so could you have used um, reliability metrics instead of the total energy generated? Because that would be an indicator of whether it's enough or not enough. I would definitely consider that it's a it's working paper. So, I the re, are you talking about a re, reliability metrics? Yeah, it's a nice point to consider. Thank you. Because um, I've been doing doing some work in Papua New, New Guinea, and we've also had some issues here in British Columbia, and that that. The, the idea of the importance of these institutions, I think, is a really clear one and, and often to have to be able to communicate to people at the political level. Yeah, that actually, if you think if you have weak institutions and you think that you're helping by artificially depressing prices, for example, um, that it can actually have a big have a problem. It can blow back because then you don't get that investment. Um, and then but the, but one of the key indicators I find is the 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 reliability issue because at the end of the day if there's insufficient investment in the industry that's how you will see it is the lights don't go on yeah yes uh, and a, an unstable market in general just it, it's not a good place to be so if we can stabilize the market i think there is more than just investors that can contribute to to a solution yeah that's certainly for my experience has been in those in those emerging economies. That's one of the biggest concerns is that people will think that they'll they'll sign an you know they'll go in there build a plant sign an agreement, but then government will step it doesn't in. Happen. Yeah, yeah, government will step in, and then it's like, oh, what do I do with my investment? So yeah, I think those institutional, the independence, independent, and those um, those proper frameworks are critical. Yes, Stephen, thank you for your comment. I really appreciate it. Vito, you. Raise your hand. I raise my my hand. Um, a, a question because it's um, the the main the main factors that I know that can influence the cost is something much more uh, of generation cost, something much more uh, basic as the, the access to um, the, uh, to some kind of. Uh, um, if, uh, energy source. If a country, for instance, Norway, is, is has very cheap energy because uh, it has a lot of water, and the Sweden, uh, just the, the neighbor of Sweden, uh, the, doesn't have access to this uh, to, to 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 this uh, so many so much so many uh, water. So, do you consider these kind of factors, or uh, do you really make this this these effects, this these basic effects yeah. of? Uh, uh the more or less integration we in, in uh, with other markets the more or less liberalization the more or less uh, access to to uh cheap energy source etc um so you're asking ge geography based um you know so some countries might use more solar some countries might use wind uh energy turbines um the reason why i'm focusing on institutions is there's there's a lot of studies done on is it more efficient geography that it is but um i'm specializing a bit in economics as well and there's this question about why is economies poorer than why are some economies poorer than others and then what ashma glue basically does is he, he goes and he asks is institutions maybe the cost to this so i've thought is institutions a large part to play in this um other than geography factors because we haven't kind of looked at it it should be in consideration i mean in countries like south africa we have institutions that play a vital role in our economy or uh, our or electricity, and the problem is they're failing and they're causing harm to the to the economy, load shedding currently. So, I think that is a bigger part than whether we we need to consider geography or uh, um, 
Yes, yes, it's it's it was something a little bit more uh, than uh, than geography. It's uh, asking if you withdraw this external factor that can uh, constrain the the, the cost uh, at the beginning. But um, it's 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 only this this question. So you you consider only the the institutions uh, the institutional effect without yes, withdrawing. Uh without doing a Ceteris Paribus analysis, comparing what can be compared and uh, eliminate, eliminating these external effects. It's... So the study is limited to, to institutions currently. Um, what we generally looked at, we wanted to include institutions as one variable uh, with a principal component analysis. But then we can't see the individual institutional effects. Um, I think where you, you use a principal component analysis as an index for institutions, it's definitely going to be a more valid study to do these external factors that you're talking about to take them into account as well. So that would be a much better one. But the focus of this study was solely to see um, the individual. We wanted to see maybe there's a pattern, maybe this is the most important institution to change in each country or in a certain group of countries. Uh, we would definitely have liked to have a big, a bigger um, spectrum of uh, countries, but the data is very limiting to this to see it. Um, can you can you clarify for me the external factors that you're talking about? Just uh, the, sim the, simple f the simple fact that some countries have access to very uh, cheap uh, energy source and other countries, for example, is if you compare Japan to Norway, they are, uh, they are, they, they are a very developed country with uh, quite similar institutions, maybe in terms of corruption, maybe not, but in general, yes, they are West so-called Western countries. And um, the, the, the energy is much more expensive in Japan than in, uh, in Norway. Only the main the main factor is uh, is the fact that Norway has uh, almost uh, energy with at the marginal cost equal to zero because there's uh, unlimited uh, access to water to produce energy. So, and Japan have to um, Japan has to uh, import uh, everything. So. Um, it was only that it's i think that it's a main factor eliminating this external factor after that i think that we uh, maybe it will be uh, more robust to go ahead with the, the institutional efforts it's Definitely, only a, a, a mere opinion you know, no no it's a, it's it's a good uh, for future for or for editing the paper as well it is a good comment thank you very much but, but did you consider introducing fixed effect in your regression because for the moment fixed there's no fix is done. It's at the back in, in the appendix. So okay. uh, sorry for interrupting. Um, okay. So no. Okay. I, I I did all the statistical uh, tests and then fixed effects. And then after that I went to my HUR model. Okay. 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 Other questions? Okay, so I think that uh, in order to keep uh, the timing, uh, maybe uh, we can uh, we can stop here. So thank you very much, uh, Ananda. And uh, so we will now switch to Ines, uh, who will uh, present. Uh, um, we'll talk also about the role of uh, of institutions through uh, regulatory uh, incentives, uh, which is one type of uh, institutional uh, intervention. Uh, so maybe can you share your screen? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Let me share. Can you see it? Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Karin. So, okay, thank um, you very much. So my name is Ines. I am a PhD student at the Center for Management Studies at Institute Superior Technic in Lisbon University. Uh, the paper I'm going to present to you today is entitled "Modeling Green Innovation Decision Making." with regulatory incentives and firm acquisitions. So I, 
I would like to start with a quick motivation for the paper. So climate change and evolving preferences, regulations and technologies are creating new market opportunities, especially from consumers. Consumers are increasingly aware of the impact that their consumption patterns have on sustainability. And so supplying green products is emerging as a firm strategy. Companies can gain and sustain competitive advantage by doing so. However, many firms are still reluctant to conduct low carbon innovation due to several reasons. For instance, the requirement of high initial investment, the uncertainty involved in the whole process and the long cycle of return. Moreover, innovation can also be obtained by acquisition. So by acquiring a firm that already owns the technology desired or has the relevant know-how or production capabilities. Um, however, relying only on the market is not enough. So government incentives and regulations are needed to address some market failures and barriers. Uh, what we see is that different regulations can have different impacts on low carbon technological innovation, but nevertheless, regulations can improve clean performance by affecting the costs and the benefits of the environmental behavior of firms. And that's what we try to do in this paper. So we use game theory to assess low carbon innovation decision making by a firm and green consumption choices by a consumer. Um, both our players are rational, meaning that they want to maximize their payoffs. And even though you will see that in our models, we only consider one consumer and one firm, they are representative of the consumers and producers in the society. Uh, regarding the models, so our models consist of consumer firm games. We will have simultaneous and sequential games. And for the simultaneous games, we will present Nash equilibria in both pure and mixed strategies. Uh, we have five scenarios. So the, five, the first scenario is a model with no government intervention, meaning that the players do not have any type of external incentive affecting their decisions. Then we have two models with the government intervention. So first we will apply a subsidy to the consumer when the consumer buys a green product. So of course the consumer buys a green product means that the firm will produce the green product. Then we have a second model with government intervention in which there is discriminatory policy to the firm, meaning that the firm will have a benefit, for instance, a subsidy, if it offers a green product, and it will have a punishment, for instance, a tax, if it, it decides to produce a non-green product. Then we have a model with acquisition, meaning that the firm can acquire a startup to obtain the green innovation, for instance, instead of innovating in-house. And our final scenarios present two models with sequential decision-making, which means that one side of the market uh, observes the characteristics of the other before making its own decision. So now for the base model here, uh, we have in the first table, a matrix of the game in strategic form. So payoffs are represented by C if they are respect to the consumer and by F if they refer to the firm. Consumers have two strategies. They can consume green or consume non-green. And producers also has to have two strategies, to produce green or to produce non-green. Then here we have the payoffs, um, the parameters within each payoff. So for instance, show, okay, so A here is the base utility of the consumer. So what the consumer gains from, from buying the product, regardless of if it is a green product or not. Then we have X, which is, it represents utility loss. And we can have two reasons to have a utility loss. We can have what we call mismatch decisions. For instance, we can have a green consumer that decided to be green, but he only has a non-green product available. So this is what we mean by mismatch decisions between demand and supply. And of course, the other way around. So we can have a consumer that decided to be a non-green consumer, but it only has a green product available. So it will lose some utility. However, we also consider here that non-green purchases also can decrease the utility. And the reason why is because we assume that the greenness of the product is a vertical um, differentiation. This means that like intrinsic quality, it's never undesirable. So when the consumer, even if the, the consumer decided to be a non-green consumer and buys a non-green product, you will still have some utility loss because we assume that by buying a non-green product is buying an inferior good. 
and so you will lose some utility. Then we have the firm's base payoff, which is B, what they gain from making the transi transaction. We have Y, which is the innovation cost from, uh, sorry, from producing green, of course, because at this point we assume that the firm does not have a green product to offer. So if it decides here, produce green, it will have to invest in technological innovation, for instance, in R&D. And then we have Z, which represent the revenue losses due to mismatch between demand and supply again. So for instance, F12, it means that we have a green consumer, a consumer that decided to have a green attitude, but it only has a non-green product available. And so there is some revenue loss due to this mismatch. And I will not try to bother you too much with this, but here in this table, we have uh, the conditions for the payoffs. And what we see is that the best payoff for the consumer is C11. So it's when the consumer decides to be green and the producer decides to be green. So they are aligned. Of course, the worst payoff for the consumer is C12, is when the consumer decided to be green, but it only has a non-green product available. And regarding the firm, we see that the best uh, payoff for the firm is to, to offer a non-green product to a non-green consumer. So again, their decisions are aligned, but now both of them have a non-green attitude. And the order of the remaining payoffs will depend on the relationship between the innovation cost and the revenue losses Z1 and Z2. So now going to our first model, the model with no government intervention and solving the game in pure strategies, we see that there is no dominant strategy for the consumer. This means that the consumer will choose green if she expects the firm to offer a green product and it will choose non-green if, if she expects the firm to offer a non-green product. And this is something that we see towards all our models that are simultaneous. So the consumer never has a dominant strategy. It will always decide depending on the decision of what he expects the, the firm to do. Regarding the firm, what we see in terms of equilibrium is that the Nash equilibrium will depend on the relationship between the innovation cost Y and the revenue loss Z2. And Z2 is here, so is the revenue loss when a green consumer has to buy a non-green product. And what we see is that if the innovation cost is higher than this revenue loss, then we have a non-green outcome. The Nash equilibrium will be consume non-green, produce non-green. If the innovation cost is lower than this revenue loss, we have two Nash equilibria. And so we can indeed have a green outcome in which the equilibrium is consume green, produce green, but we can also have a non-green outcome in which again, it is consume non-green, produce non-green. Now moving, yes. So now regarding mixed strategies, we also calculated the probabilities so for instance, the probability of consumers adopting a green attitude is this probability P. And because these are mixed strategies, we are using the payoffs of the firm. So if you notice, even though this is a probability of the consumer deciding to be green, the payoffs are referred to the firm. So because when we do mixed strategies, the idea is we are looking for the probability of the consumer choosing a green product that makes the firm to be indifferent between producing green and producing non-green. Okay, so that's why we are indeed, we, what we have is the payoffs of the firm affecting the probability of the consumer. And the same here for probability Q. So probability Q is a probability of the firms producing green. So what this probability tells us is how many firms we need deciding to be green in order to make consumers indifferent between choosing to consume green or to consume non-green. So it's this randomization. Okay, so now still in model A and regarding welfare. And at this point in this paper, we are not considering environmental welfare. We are only considering welfare like consumer surplus and producer surplus. We see that the best outcome for both sides of the market is when consumers and producers are aligned towards the same goal. And this same, same goal can, of course, be both of them decide to be green or both of them decide to be non-green. However, total welfare when both players decide to be green is only higher than the welfare when both of them are non-green if the innovation cost is lower than X2. And the X2 is this idea, again, of the inferior good. So the utility loss by the non-green consumer that this 
decided to buy a non-green product and this non-green product is available. So this utility loss due to the vertical differentiation. Okay, so now moving to the first model with government intervention, we see that we apply a consumer subsidy policy. So if the consumer buys a green product, means that it means that the producer produced a green product, we add this SC, which is the subsidy. Uh, I will be very fast here because what we see is that the results of this model are exactly the same as in the previous model with no government intervention in both pure and mixed strategies. So what this tells us is that giving a subsidy to the consumption of green goods and giving this subsidy to the consumer does not affect the consumers and the firm decisions. Then moving to our second model with government intervention. So now we have the discriminatory policy, meaning that if the firm decides to produce green, it will receive this SP, this subsidy. But if the firm decides to produce non-green, it will have this punishment, this minus E. And in this model, again, solving for uh, uh, pure strategies, once again, we have no dominant strategy for the consumer. However, if the subsidy covers the innovation costs, the penalty for producing non-green uh, non -green product and the revenue loss Z1, we see that we can have an outcome that is a green outcome. So the Nash equilibrium in this case will be consume green and produce green. However, for other, um, other um, subsidies, so if the subsidy does not cover these, two, these three parameters, we see that we always have a non-negative outcome as a possibility. Either there are multiple Nash equilibria and we have consume green, produce green, and consume non-green, produce non-green, or just a non-green equilibrium here, okay? Then here, I will try to be fast due to time, but we also solve the probabilities in mixed strategies. And what's it's interesting here is that now probability P, which is the probability of the consumers adopting a green attitude, is lower. This means that if, in order for the firm to be indifferent to produce green and produce non-green, now the share of consumers deciding to have a green attitude is lower. So the chance that the firm will offer a green product is higher because it needs to have less green consumers in order to do so. Here, okay. And now we have the model with acquisition. So in this model, we add a new strategy to the firm. So besides being a strategy of producing green, producing non-green, the firm can also buy green. The idea of acquiring, a, for instance, a startup that already has the, the innovation desired. The difference in terms of payoffs is that now we have X4, which is a loss in utility that we consider because if there is an acquisition, the market will get more concentrated. And so this means that there are less options available to the consumer. So there is a slight um, decrease in the utility. And we consider here the cost of the acquisition, which is K. And of course, if the firm goes forward with the acquisition, it does not have to pay the innovation cost Y, which is the cost of innovating in-house. Now the firm acquires another company, and so it only has the cost of the acquisition. Okay, regarding pure strategies, um, if the acquisition cost is lower than this revenue loss Z2, then we can have an outcome in which there is an acquisition here, consume green, buy green. Okay, but if this happens, we also have another two Nash equilibria. So consume green, produce green is also a possible outcome, but it also is consume non-green and produce non-green. However, if the acquisition cost is higher than this revenue loss Z2, then the acquisition is not a possibility. And so the only possible outcomes for this game is to consume green by green. So acquire the, the innovation, developing the innovation in-house and consume non-green, produce non-green. I'm going to skip this, but these are just the probabilities of this model. Okay, and finally, sequential gains. If the firm decides first and the consumer decides second, the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium will for sure be a non-green outcome. So consume non-green, produce non-green. But however, if we let the consumer decide first and the firm decide second after observing the decision of the consumer, there, this is slightly different. So if the consumer decides to consume non-green, then the outcome of the game will inevitably be consume non-green, produce non-green. 
But if the consumer decides to consume green, then the outcome of the game will depend on the relationship between these three parameters, the innovation cost, the acquisition cost, and the revenue loss Z2. And so depending on the minimum of these three, we can have uh, for sure a green outcome, either by acquisition here, if K is the minimum, or either by developing the innovation in-house if the innovation cost is the minimum. Um, okay, so I think I'm in time. Uh, regarding conclusions, so uh, the best outcome in terms of uh, welfare is when both sides of the market are aligned towards the same goal. Either both of them have a green attitude or both of them have a non-green attitude. Then we see that if um, both a green outcome is possible, is obtainable, but either there is government intervention, and as we saw, the subsidy has to cover the innovation costs, the penalty of producing non-green and the revenue loss, or consumers take a leadership position and dictate the rules of the market, as we saw here in, in the last model with the sequential decision making. Um, under firm discriminatory policy, we saw that the proportion of consumers with a great attitude needed to make the firm indifferent is lower. So the firm is more likely to innovate and to offer green products. And finally, we see that a green outcome via acquisition is obtainable, but only if the, the acquisition cost is lower than the revenue loss due to the mismatch between demand and supply. Um, yeah, so this is the references. Um, this is still a work in progress and it's a very preliminary version. So any type of feedback and suggestions will be very appreciated. I would like to see this paper moving more towards the acquisition question because it's where we, we see a literature, a gap in the literature. And this is it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ines. Uh, so, are there any questions, suggestions, comments, uh, everything, reaction? Jackie, yeah? Hi. Um, so, I, I think part of mine is maybe in that reaction thing. So, one of my takeaways as you were going through it, it's, it seemed to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that the thrust of it was that it's better to give, the, to give incentives to the supplier than the customer on the basis, I guess, if the customer wants to purchase green and there is no green available, then then it addresses that problem. But I'm just wondering, part of the reason to give incentives to a customer would be to change them from someone who who wants non-green to, oh, there's a discount now, something's on sale, now I will buy the green. So mm -hmm. does it capture that aspect that it, uh, the incentives to the customer might switch them from non-green to green? And so uh, we have two types of policies here. So first we assess formal policy in like giving a subsidy. And what we see is that giving a subsidy to the consumer will not change the decisions, but giving a subsidy to uh, a subsidy and a penalty to the firm will change the decisions. But we can also have an informal policy. And that's the idea we try to pass with the sequential game. So for instance, engaging in um, uh, consumer energy education, environmental education, and uh, for instance, um, consumer awareness of the effects of their consumption. If you engage in that, then you can try to change the behavior by changing the, um, the utility losses, because in the end, the, this will be affected in the model. If we change the loss of utility, so how the consumer perceives when he buys a green product versus when he buys a non-green product, if we try to change that, then you can have a green outcome. But that's the idea of formal policy versus informal policy. When we start with formal policy, we see that giving the, the, the subsidy directly to the consumer, if he buys green, will not change then the, the remaining equilibrium, but not the same with informal policy. That would be my, my answer to your question. Thank you. I I didn't get uh, well the, the the role of competition because you, you you mentioned that you you have only one firm, but uh, in with all this uh, question competition is supposed also to play a big role. So how do you consider yeah, that? At, at Yes, so sorry. Um, at this point, we don't consider competition. So the fact that we have one firm does not mean that this is a monopoly. This is just a simplification of the model. But yeah, I think um, a next step here would be the role of competition 
in prices or quantities and to give consumers choice when selecting the, the products, yeah. Because yeah. in the same way, there's no price in your... No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's... Uh, and there's no um, signal uh, problem and greenwashing and all this type of thing uh, that are also a big part of the story, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't, you don't uh, consider that? Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah, this this is very preliminary version, so we are still navigating what uh, what can be considered. But yes, the role of um, the market and the um, structure of the market and other firms will, uh, yeah, it's a, a potential. Yeah, also, the question yeah. of the size of, uh, uh, I mean, also also in the in the consumer uh, market. I mean, depending on the size and the elasticity price mm -hmm. and demand of the. I mean, it's uh, it's all about. Uh, green procurement uh, which is a big part uh, that there's a great literature on that but they they almost directly consider the competition situation the question of uh, signaling of the the greenness of the of the product and uh, also the elasticity price of demand for uh, for green product because you you usually assume that green products are more expensive than the than non-green product for covering the cost of innovation and so on. So mm -hmm. it's the whole, uh, but it's another uh, type of, uh, of uh, yeah, modeling. A possible extension, yes. Um, yeah. yeah, it's true. Even the consumer willingness to pay green product, it would change things here in the model, both on the side of the consumer, but also on the revenues of the firm. So mm -hmm. for sure that would change, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Thank you. Victor? Yes, sorry. Um, can we conclude for this very preliminary research that at this stage, if we do, do not have um, uh, competition, uh, the film has to be regulated? Sorry, can you? Can if you there's no that? competition, uh, the film has to be regulated. There, there's, the, there's the need to, be, to have regulation. Yes. It's the first conclusion of the, the first stage of the first step of your research before you introduce more complexity, the competitiveness, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So a question. yes, yes. So when we have no government intervention, so in the base model, without any type of intervention, what we see is that there is always a non-green outcome as a possibility. There is a chance that if the innovation costs are very, very low, comparing with the revenue loss, you might have a green outcome as, as a possibility, but the non-green outcome is still a chance. But if, um, if the innovation costs are higher, then the, without any type of intervention from the government, then it's always a non-green uh, outcome for this game. So yeah, that's the conclusion. We really need to have government intervention in order to push the market towards a green uh, outcome. Yeah. But at, at this uh, stage of the, the reasoning, why introducing this possibility to buy uh, a startup and not letting the startup uh, sell herself uh, the green product? Uh, just the cost of, okay. So the startup is just innovation cost, regardless of how you get the innovation. Is mm -hmm. that, okay. Okay, because um, I think my, well, my idea was to try to move towards the acquisition. So what influences acquisitions when we have a market that is trying to innovate for a green uh, product or uh, to have at least a green process within uh, its production. So what can be the role of uh, acquisitions here? But uh, I move backwards and I try to begin. So let's see if we have no intervention and then what if we had intervention and we can develop in-house and what changes between developing in-house and developing by acquiring a firm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But I, I would say that at, the, at this level of simplification, because this question of make or buy is interesting as soon as you consider the, the transaction cost and, uh, and, I mean, you complexify the, mm -hmm. the relationship between the, the, the two firms. Um, in a very simplified uh, framework as yours, I don't see very well what is the, why, Telling this right. story, uh, since you don't consider what makes the trade-off uh, uh, plausible, I would say. So okay. it's, uh, 
maybe okay. maybe more to yes. elaborate on that because at, at this stage, given the the, the big simplification that you make, uh, we don't see very well why considering this uh, specific case of uh, acquisition in the make or buy decision, basically. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. And even because we are only assuming one firm, but then suddenly, so there is another firm to acquire. So yeah, so also considering the, the competition and then only then if it's worth it to the acquisition. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. it makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay, other questions? No? Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Ines. And uh, so we will switch now to the presentation by uh, Jackie, uh, and um, who comes from the, the British Columbia Utilities Commission, so from the regulators, I would say. So, so I uh, give you the floor for 20 minutes uh, maximum. If you can share your screen, your screen, yeah, and uh, and we don't hear you. Sorry, so you should hear me now. So I'll just now share we my... hear you, and then uh, I'll just put the slideshow on. Okay, do you see it? Not yet. My slides aren't up. No. At least myself, I don't see them. Okay, I'll just, oh, sorry, there you go, stream one. Okay. Okay. That's it. That's it. All right. Okay. Uh, maybe if you can just, just close down this one. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. So now that's back up. Okay. So, um, hello and thank you for attending this session. My name is Jackie Ashley and I work for the British Columbia Utilities Commission as a senior regulatory specialist. However, this presentation today represents my own personal views and doesn't represent the views or opinions of the BCUC nor does it express any opinion on pending or future matters before the BCUC. So with that out of the way, today I'll be presenting an energy regulator's public interest toolkit. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah. there is a presentation. Uh, say, can you click on display setting on the left edge and, and to switch to the presentation mode because um, we don't see it full screen, please. Okay, so let me just stop share. Sorry, no. I'll go back in again. So I'm stopping sharing now, right? So I'll just get back out of this. Sorry, screen share. Uh, screen two, share. Do you see it now? Yeah, it's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very Sorry. much. Perfect. So what is a public interest toolkit? The toolkit is based on an approach developed by the newly formed New Zealand Electricity Authority in 2010. At that time, public trust and energy regulation had been a real problem. Carl Hansen, the newly appointed CEO and co-author of this paper, wanted to provide stakeholders with a clear explanation of how the Electricity Authority would be interpreting its public interest statutory objective. I was working at the Electricity Authority at the time and clearly recall our lawyer raising a concern that defining the public interest could create a rod for our own back and reduce our flexibility in decision making. However, Carl considered that it was necessary in order to provide the level of profound transparency that the public were looking for from its regulator. Upon returning to Canada, I decided to use these foundation documents to come up with a public interest toolkit that could be used by other regulators. It is this four page toolkit that I will be presenting today. The toolkit invites regulators to start with a clear problem definition, evaluate options to address the problem definition against their public interest definition, and consult broadly, early, and often along the way to ensure they have all the facts. 
It doesn't give the answers, but is focused on ensuring a robust process and analysis. So the toolkit comprises four checklists which are integrated. The first one is a regulatory proposal checklist, which provides a logical roadmap to ensure the regulator and not the utility frames the application review process. The second item is a public interest checklist, and this assists regulators in first defining the public interest, what is in and out of scope, for example, and then evaluating options against the public interest definition. The third item is the consultation checklist. This ensures that utilities have done their homework prior to filing the application. And lastly, the efficient regulation checklist helps ensure regulators review their own regulatory approach to make sure that they are efficient, promote innovation, and don't place unnecessary burdens on utilities. So the first item is a regulatory proposal checklist. This provides a roadmap when reviewing utility applications. It addresses Scott Hempling's request that the regulator ask not what decisions do the parties want, but rather what decisions does the public interest require. The regulatory proposal checklist has seven categories. The first is a requirement the application includes sufficient background information, such as a history of previous experience with this matter and any external requirements. This is important to ensure the decisions of the regulator reflect historical continuity. Commissioners don't have to follow precedent in their decisions, but it's certainly a good idea to know what decisions have been made previously on similar applications. So if a different decision is made this time, they can clearly explain why. The next item, and I would say the most important item on this list, is a requirement to start with a clear problem definition and to ensure that the problem definition is both supported by evidence and the public interest checklist, which is the next checklist on this toolkit. This may seem fairly simple, but I find that one of the most significant aspects of this public interest toolkit, consider an application by a utility to invest in EV charging stations, change its net metering rate or increase fixed charges. It's often not so straightforward as to what the problem definition should be. And if you start with the wrong problem definition, then it's really hard to do any kind of economic analysis on the utility's application. The public interest checklist I'll be going through next gives a lot more guidance and information on how to come up with a proper problem definition that is aligned with the public interest. The third and fourth step is to make sure that the utility has identified and evaluated a range of options to address the problem, that it hasn't just come forward with one solution without considering other potential options. The fifth step is to ensure that assumptions are clearly stated in the analysis. This is increasingly important because the pace of change that we're seeing in the energy industry is like nothing we've seen previously. The past can no longer be used to predict the future. And for example, battery costs forecast that are a year old can already be significantly out of date. Use of different discount rates can also have significant impacts on an economic analysis when assets are long lived. It's crucially important to make sure that any assumptions are clearly stated. Consultation is also important. You want to ensure that the utility has done their homework by evaluating the consultation approach against the consultation checklist. This is a key part of testing the problem definition. Options and key assumptions used without, um, adequate, cons and without adequate consultation, utilities may not have all the information they need to decide on their preferred option. And lastly, the utility should have support its recommended option and any key trade-offs made should be highlighted. The approach described in the regulatory proposal checklist may seem fairly straightforward, but as I mentioned, when you apply it against, for example, utilities request to install EV charging stations or to change its net metering rate or increase fixed charges, it can turn the application on its head and result in asking questions that a regulator might not otherwise have asked. The second item in the toolkit is the public interest checklist. And for those of you familiar with Bombright rate design principles, you can see the parallels here. This is used to both help develop the problem definition and to evaluate options. I'll walk through the items in this checklist and then do a deeper dive into some of the items on this list. So the first one is lawful to make sure that the option being put forward is compliant with relevant regulation and legislation. The second item is fairness and I'll go into this in more detail later on but just know for now that it's a fairly narrow definition of fairness stating that prices should be designed to avoid undue discrimination and rate shocks should be mitigated to the extent possible. The third item is economic efficiency. And here we are looking at making sure that the option promotes efficient customer consumption and investment decisions, efficient utility operation and investment decisions, efficient regulation, and I have a separate checklist for that one. And lastly, innovation. The fourth item is reliability. 
to make sure that the proposal supports both short-term and long-term reliability, including the utility's need to access financing. The fifth item is safety, to make sure that safety is considered in an evaluation, and the sixth item is customer satisfaction. I consider that the role of the regulator is to take the place of the competitive market, and if companies operating in the competitive market have a significant focus on customer satisfaction, then I would expect a utility should have a similar focus. The last three items are consideration of environmental impacts, social impacts, and economic development impacts. You'll note that the checklist is split into two categories, items that are, that are traditionally within the scope of an economic regulator, the first six items on the list, and those where government policy direction may be required, which includes environmental, social, and economic development considerations. For example, in British Columbia and New Zealand, the regulator is primar primarily an economic regulator, and so the focus is on the first six items. However, some regulators do have broader mandates. For example, they might be tasked with delivering on emissions reductions targets or addressing fuel poverty. It's really important for regulators to have a clear understanding of what's in and out of scope with regard to delivering on its public interest mandate and to then ensure that it's clearly communicated to stakeholders. The other item I'd like to point out is that the checklist does not include low price, but instead has a heavy emphasis on economic efficiency. And this approach is consistent with Bombright's rate design principles. The regulator's job is to get prices right, not low, not high, just right. For example, prices that are set too low could reduce the ability of the utility to access financing and so negatively affect reliability over the longer term. It's therefore in both the customer's and the regulator's best interest to arrive at the right price, not just a low price. Another item to note under economic efficiency is that the first bullet includes efficient customer consumption and investment decisions. This is an area where regulators can differ in New Zealand and British Columbia, for example, the regulators have a whole of the market focus when we look at economic efficiency. We aren't just concerned with making sure the utility is efficiently supplying energy. We're also concerned with making sure that the customer isn't wasting it once it's being delivered. So we're concerned about improving the efficiency of the demand and the supply side of the market. However, not all regulators may have this whole of the market focus. The third bullet under economic efficiency refers to efficient regulation. And this is the fourth checklist in the toolkit and I will discuss that later. The last time I'd like to highlight on this list is that we do have a fairness included on there, but it's a fairly narrow definition of fairness. And the reason why I haven't just included a generic fairness definition that's broader than Bombrights is that it can be very subjective. Consider the question of higher or lower fixed charges. Everyone can have a different opinion on what is fair and they could all be right. Bromby instead gives us a very clear and quantifiable definition of what undue discrimination could be. This includes making sure that prices don't seriously distort the relative use of service. For example, if you have a discounted rate that doesn't recover the utility's incremental cost or gives a customer an unfair competitive advantage over another. Interestingly, Bromby also says that not charging more for on-peak service could be considered discriminatory for utilities nearing full capacity. The fairness definition included here is therefore something that can be measured and determined using data. It's not a subjective measure, while a more subjective consideration of fairness is captured under the social criteria below. So the problem definition from the first checklist should map through to the public interest toolkit. For example, a problem definition of not enough EV charging stations or generic concern that existing fixed charges are unfair does not map through directly to this checklist, and so you would have to dig deeper. A valid problem definition in those cases could, for example, show that the status quo was inefficient and that the utility could cost effectively address that inefficiency. Ensuring a clearly articulated problem definition can be a really valuable first step in helping to reframe an application. The checklist is also used to evaluate options to address the problem. For example, you might question why the, the utility is only proposing to invest in EV charging stations and not also launching an advertising campaign, extolling the benefits of EV cars in order to get this additional profitable load. In summary, this checklist does place a fairly heavy emphasis on economic efficiency. And if we can make the market more efficient overall, both the supply and the demand side, then everyone will benefit. And that, is, I think, is more important than ever, given the market transformation underway. The third checklist in the toolkit is a consultation checklist. Consultation is important at all stages of the process. Energy is everybody's business and there are more people involved in it now than ever. The consultation checklist comes from the New Zealand Electricity Authority and it was based on a 1993 Court of Appeal decision. 
The first item states that there are no universal requirements as to the form of consultation and any type of interaction that allows adequate expression and consideration of views will be sufficient. Secondly, consultation must be allowed sufficient time and a genuine effort must be made. Thirdly, consultation involves a statement of a proposal not yet fully decided on, listening to what others have to say, considering their responses and then deciding what to do. Fourthly, for consultation to be meaningful, the utility must, be avail must make available sufficient information to enable parties who are consulted to be adequately informed to make intelligent and useful responses. The fifth and sixth criteria acknowledge that consultation does not require agreement. And the seventh criteria states that the utility must approach the matter with an open mind, and must be prepared to change or even start the process afresh. I think that last criteria is one of the most important ones because if we wait until an application comes to the regulator for a re review, it's really hard for the utility to change its proposal if new information is provided. It's much better for the utility to seek out input at an earlier stage when it has not decided upon the proposal it wants to put forward. Regulators often talk about the benefits of our open and transparent proceedings, but I recently heard someone comment that it's only open and transparent for lawyers. And I do agree that our proceedings can be fairly formal and so limit participation by stakeholders or other knowledgeable parties. The idea with this checklist is to push the responsibility for, check, for consultation to the utility so that they go through this consultative process before they bring an application into the regulator. Incentive regulation can also be used to make sure that the incentives of the utility are aligned with the public interest and so they have a motivation to listen to the input they are receiving and come up with a proposal that is in the public interest. So now we get to the last item on the tool list, the efficient regulation checklist. This is important because in striving to support the public interest, regulation itself can be a market barrier. The purpose of the efficient regulation checklist is therefore to describe the attributes of regulation that can be best, best support efficiency and innovation. This checklist was developed by Carl Hansen, my co-author. The first is a preference for specifying the outcomes desired rather than what the utility must do and how they must do it. We see this often now in the shift towards incentive regulation. The second is a preference for options that have larger pro-competition effects because greater competition is likely to promote long-term economic efficiency and innovation. The third item is a preference for market solutions. And the fourth is a preference for flexibility to allow innovation. The fifth item is a preference for minimizing regulatory burden by ensuring that no unnecessary regulatory burden is imposed on participants. And the last item on the list is a preference for options that are initially small scale, flexible, scalable and easily reversible. Pilot projects would be a great example of this. In essence, this regulation checklist supports regulatory decisions that promote innovation, as ongoing innovation is a key driver of higher living standards for consumers over the longer term. So I think we have enough time to give a quick example of how the public interest toolkit would work. And a good example of here could be a net metering application. Under a net metering rate, a customer receives a retail price for the energy that's fed into the grid. Let's assume in this case that a utility is arguing that it should discontinue its net metering rate on the basis that these customers are not paying their fair share of the network cost. The regulatory proposal checklist states that I need to start with a problem definition that maps through to the public interest checklist. I then go to my public interest checklist and I can quickly see that the fairness definition is fairly narrow, focused on ensuring prices are not discriminatory. Unless the utility isn't recovering its marginal cost to serve a customer, a generic unfairness complaint by the, the utility doesn't stack up as a valid problem definition. Everyone can have a different opinion on what is fair and they can all be right. And when you think about it, a customer with solar PV on their roof can look similar to a customer with gas heating. They're both low use customers. If the electricity utility didn't complain in the past about customers with gas heating not paying a fair share of the cost of the grid, why would the utility be complaining now about customers that become low use because they install solar panels on their roof? Just doesn't make sense. But when you look at the economic efficiency criteria, I think the real reason that a utility might have an issue becomes clear. The first efficiency criteria is around ensuring efficient customer investment decisions. If the net meeting rate is overpaying the customer for the energy that their solar system is producing, then this could be a problem. As solar panels have decreased in cost significantly and it's become increasingly easy to install them, overpaying customers for the energy generated risks uneconomic bypass of the utility. Looking at it from an economic efficiency perspective makes addressing the utility's request much easier. 
you can compare the retail price received by the customer under the net metering rate with an estimate of the value of the energy that's generated. The retail price is significantly higher than the energy is worth, then maybe adjustments to the rates are needed. There might be other considerations such as customer satisfaction, environmental or economic development considerations that also factor into the decision. But the key benefit from the toolkit is that it provides a framework for discussion. It can prompt regulators to ask questions they might not otherwise have asked or to an approach an application from a different perspective. It also sets a high bar for utility consultation. And I encourage regulators to take the next application they get and run it through the checklist and see what additional questions or perspectives they might come up with. So in summary, I hope that this public interest toolkit can assist regulators looking to develop their own public interest definition. And if you'd like more information, I encourage you to read the paper, which will be included as a conference proceedings, or to reach out to Carla and myself. Thanks, and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Um, so, any questions? Remarks, uh, everything? Peter, you know? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's, it's uh, I'm a regulator myself. I work for a regulator uh, myself. And uh, we we just been uh, even weighed by uh, OCDA. And uh, uh, and some of some of the issues is is uh, have been uh, have been addressed this, uh, in this um, in this presentation the, the issues that face the the, the regulators. Um, in our case, we we already have something that I think that is uh, quite unique. Uh, it's what the OCD say to us that it's we've got a tariff council where uh, or our proposals are submitted and um, in these tariff councils and uh, uh, there's the, the there's consumers there's uh, the industry the utilities etc and they, um, they provide non-binding opinion so uh, it's maybe more useful for us more easy to, for us to know what um, to be to have a, 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 a theoretically to have a, 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 more, um, a better commitment uh, between uh, on one hand the, 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 the regulator and the other hand the consumers and the stakeholders in general. Um, but um, something that I uh, uh, came into uh, to my mind, it's with the, this toolkit, uh, you, you, you present the toolkit and um, who will regulate and we will make the follow-up of the toolkit at the end, who will evaluate if uh, you um, you comply with you pro, uh, with your uh, your uh, your rules that you self uh, <laughs> define for yourself, and uh, who will this who, who you, do you think that uh, you should uh, hear most the, the consumers, the domestic the households consumers the the industry the utilities the government. Etc. Who will at the end have more weight in the balance? Um, I think the idea when you're talking about weight, like a, a, a decision, a, a decision should be based on the facts, right? As opposed, like customer satisfaction is in there, and that is a relevant criteria. But if you have a look at the um, the public interest checklist piece, you have to start off with like, how are you going to do that evaluation? And so you need to pull the facts in from various areas and consulting more um, and having those kind of groups are great because that enables you to bring additional facts into the into the debate. Um, but it shouldn't be a final result shouldn't necessarily be just a who speaks the loudest <laughs> because you're not the outcomes in the public interest do require that as i said this this whole idea that if you have if you promote economic efficiency and innovation you should get those long-term benefits for customers and i have found especially with this fairness issue is that it, i've been in situations where utilities and customers everyone's saying oh it's just unfair you should do this you should do that but it's really hard for a, a decision maker to be able to to make a decision that that way if you use the the toolkit the the approach there says okay well 
I'm actually focusing, my focus here is promoting results that um, support, make the market more efficient overall. And in the long term, a more efficient market in the long term would benefit everybody. As I said, prices is not my case of high prices, low prices, it's the right price. And if you keep that focus in, you should be able to navigate that process and, and not be distracted off into just trying to make decisions based on, you know, opinion of, of artificially depressing prices now, but then you end up with reliability results later on. So um, the, in the first part of that, of the, um, of the toolkit, starting off with a problem, when we were in New Zealand, when we were presenting options to our board, we had to follow the outline. We couldn't start with a solution. We had to start with a problem and look at the options. And I think that was that was hugely beneficial because often as a regulator, the applications that come in, they just start with the solution. And, and, and then your the tendency is to just look at that, that solution in isolation instead of like pulling it back up to the hunt to the 10,000 foot level and say, okay, well, what exactly is the problem here that we're trying to solve? And let's get agreement on that and then look at all the different options. And for things like, as I said, low standby rates, low fixed charge, you know, a, a, a customer investment, a utility investment into infrastructure, it forces you to say, well, maybe there's demand side options you can use for that too. But but it's just, I, I, I have found it's, it's it, that kind of process can really turn an application on its head. Because you start, if you start with the problem definition and not the solution, you can end up with a very different perspective. Alanda, you have a question? Mm, yes, I would like to ask um, on his question, adding, um, so say clients are using the toolkit now, how would you um, ensure or robustness that it is not unequally weighed towards, say, consumers or producers? So that it uh, kind of manipulated, how uh, would you ensure yeah. that it, it it's not manipulated the toolkit? I th I think it's because it doesn't have price in there, so there shouldn't be. If, if you're if it's a monopoly industry, if the regulator should regulate it in order that the to promote outcomes in the public interest. So part of the reason why you might have that disconnect is is the way that utilities are often regulated right now. It's on return on rate base. So the more assets that they build, the better the incentive that they have to build them. And that's when you might start having that disconnect between what's in the best interest of customers and what's in the best interest of the, of the, of the utility. And that's why starting off with this whole figuring out what is in the best interest overall to everybody, and then you change the way that the utilities are regulated. You, you move away from just rewarding them based on rate base to saying, what, what are the outcomes that we want in order to promote the public interest? And then you reward them based on that. And if you can reward them based on that, then you shouldn't have that disconnect because what's in the best interest of the customer should also be in the best interest of the utility. Um, but, the, but that is the problem that, that, that we have. One of the fundamental ones is that there is this disconnect. And so it seems seem as win-lose, but if you, um, if you start off with that clear public interest definition to figure out what outcomes are in the public interest, incent and motivate the utility to achieve them, it should be win-win. We should be looking for, we should be aligned in what we're looking for, not disconnected. I have a, a question because at the end it ends up uh, like more like a wish list as a checklist. It's uh, uh, and and especially because it seemed to me that many of the objectives were contradictory, or uh, you have to choose. Uh, typically, when you say that uh, it should start a small scale, um, and in the same time uh, you request that it uh, increase competition so scale and the competition it's not uh, the same so how do you weight uh, the objectives uh, I, I guess they are supposed to stand alone and separately so so it's more a case of you do want to you know competition is if you can have something that promotes competition that should be great so that's a, that's a tick the other one shouldn't be a trade-off it, but, it, but it basically says you've got two options and one, one will com commit you to something big now and you can't, get, you can't get out of. And there is a lot of uncertainty in the industry right now. And we don't quite know how the market will evolve. Um, and, so, and so it kind of says, look, if you have two options and everything else is consistent, but, but, but one allows you to like trial it and then pull back and the other is you're, you're, you're committed and you can't pull back, then like, you know, that one that allows you to pull back a little bit and trial it might be a better one, but it assumes all else equal. The idea is, the idea is you shouldn't be trading off between those two, it's looking at them each individually. Okay. 
Okay, other questions? No? Okay, so I think that we can uh, switch to the last presentation uh, by, uh, by Vitor, uh, where we, we will also talk about regulation. So, Vitor, if you can share your screen. Sorry. Yes. Do you see? Yes. So, so if you can just put a full screen. A full screen, full screen, full screen. Well, I'm not used to, to work with, uh, uh, with Zoom. Oh, uh, right right side, my... Sorry? It's uh, on the height right corner. Right corner here. No. No, uh, the, yeah, a little bit below. Oh. Next to customize, there's a, uh, no. No, uh, yes, yeah. I find it. So, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vitor Vitor Max. I work for AERS. Uh, the paper that I'm going to present is completely uh, independent uh, from my work in AERS, uh, at AERS. The resultant comments presented in this paper are entirely uh, the author's responsibility and should not be in any, any way associated to the official opinion of S or their institution. Uh, I realized uh, uh, this, this paper with two other colleagues, um, that uh, Paul Kost and Unbent, that do not work uh, at ERS, but they are researchers. So the, the paper is uh, accelerate, the, the, the title of the paper is Accelerate Energy Transition with Smarter Regulation for Faster Grid Digitalization. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about innovation, I'm going to talk about uh, regulation, I'm going to talk about uh, network grids. And uh, what uh, what do we have? We, we have uh, we are in the energy transition context, and it required a lot of innovation, uh, mainly in the in the electricity sector and the, in those, and also in the electricity networks. Uh, if we think about the demand side management, if we think about the uh, the renewable energy that are directly uh, injecting the distribution network, if we think about uh, smart metering, uh, a more active participation of the consumers, the so-called prosumers, we know that um, at the front end, we have to. Uh, it's uh, there. Uh, we have the, the electricity network, distribution networks, and uh, most a uh, lot of uh, inno innovative investment are, is required. It's the so-called uh, smart grid, uh, smart grids, um, uh, smart grid investment in smart grids. And but what do we know? It's when we compare uh, utilities in general and. Um, uh, electricity uh, networks in particular with other uh, activities like IT, uh, telecommunication, uh, pharmaceutical industry, uh, the level of innovation is quite, is quite low. And uh, even though it's, uh, it's a 100% uh, regulated activity, because we are talking about uh, natural monopolies, and we are talking about activities that have to provide uh, essential goods, and uh, there's not so many risks. So the, the environment to invest in innovation could be uh, could be uh, uh, benefic beneficial, positive. But what we assist is uh, that when we compare this uh, this sector with others, there's not so much innovation. So what we are going to try to answer with this uh, paper, with this research, is uh, to to know what is the most suitable regulatory model to to promote investment in the new technologies that are need to modernize the electricity network. So uh, what I'm going to talk now it's about innovation on grids, but in the regulatory perspective. And uh, what, uh, what we have done, we, we, we analyze uh, several uh, innovative technologies and we group in, uh, and, and we join them in three groups, other than in three groups. And uh, the first one uh, is a substation and uh, feeder automation, SFA. SFA use specific hardware and software resource 
uh, to endo electrical networks with intelligence that allows a continuous monitoring, control, protection, data acquisition about network assets, and the execution of various various automated actions. Uh, SFA allows gathering data from different sensors and sends this data to a central computer, which manages the, the data and control device in the field remotely. The, the group of, um, of technology, it's AMI Advanced Metering Infrastructure, the, the so-called smart metering. Uh, AMI incorporates a set of features that provide an intelligent two-way connection between utilities and consumers, including the loads and the generation and storage system installed on the consumer side. Uh, the main resources used in the AMI are the smart meters and the two-way communication platform. The third group, uh, are microgrids. Uh, microgrid is an association of uh, low voltage distribution network, micro generators, loads, and storage device having some local coordinate functions. Uh, the concepts of microgrid has been developed to ease the, the integration of micro generation in, in low voltage networks. So, having uh, uh, gauging this, uh, this technology in three groups, and in, in order to, to, to know what is the best the, 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 the best way to 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 to, to develop a regulatory uh, an effective regulatory scheme to, to promote this kind of innovation as a relator as uh, first of all i will uh, i will uh, address two two dimension two issues that uh, before go ahead with the with the design of the regulatory scheme First of all, uh, I, I would like to know what are the impact of new technologies on network costs. Um, most of the regulatory schemes are input-based and uh, try to, 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 to promote uh, cost efficiency. And, uh, um, and uh, with this uh, answering to this question, uh, I will try to know if um, this kind of uh, typical regulatory scheme can, can promote or not innovation and what kind of innovative investment can be promoted with this kind of regulatory scheme. Uh, the other question is, uh, is to know uh, if the benefits go beyond the sector. Uh, that is, is there uh, positive externalities? Uh, the fact is some of the, the, these technologies, the, 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 the benefits go much beyond the, uh, the, the, the sectors and uh, it can be unfair to, to that the cost can that whole cost uh, as uh, of these uh, of these uh, technologies are recovered for the, the the access tariff paid by the electricity consumer so it's other other factor that have to be considered before go ahead with the, the regulatory scheme so in uh, in what uh, considering the the the, the first uh, the first question and uh, looking at innovative technology and cost control, uh, we we categorize the, the these three three types of uh, of technologies, and um, uh, we conclude that uh, SFA um, is much more effective to avoid operation and maintenance costs for the same level of investment than, for instance. ME and much more uh, uh, microgrids, even though microgrids has a, an effect, uh, has a quite big effect, but it's very locally. And ME um, the, 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 has also some kind of effect, but not so effective than uh, as a SFA. And considering the benefits, if they, they stay inside the sector or if they go beyond the sector, in that case, uh, clearly for us, uh, SFA, the, the most of the benefits stay inside the sector. Microgrids lie between AMI and SFA, so the, the, there's a, the, the benefits, even though they are more localized uh, in, the, in certain areas, that they, they will stay uh, in the, the sector. And AMI is uh, the, the type uh, of uh, uh, advanced metering infrastructure are the type of, uh, of technologies that have much uh, positive externality and benefits that go beyond the, the, the sector. So after the, uh, uh, perform this, uh, this um, classification, we go ahead with uh, defining this kind of uh, effective regulatory scheme. And for that, we, we develop a decision model well, this is a model that assesses the change in the firm's incentive to invest in new technology under different regulatory schemes. What we, what we develop, it's uh, uh, 
uh, decision model that considers the, the, the in the first uh, uh, the first stage the investment the the decrease of the costs due to the investment in smart grids and after the the new regulatory period and the the, the action of the, the the regulator some of the gains can be uh, retained or not by by the consumers and the, and the, uh, uh, through the action of the regulator and uh, it's where the 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 the, the the where we see the, the the most difference between uh, of course because there will be the the, the action of the relator between the, these two models so we we compare two typical models one is a pure incentive model a, a totex model um, with, um this in this uh, regulatory scheme the the regulator the, does not distinguish between opex and capex so between uh, operational expenditure and capital expenditure and we'll set the the the, if see, the same if tar target for the uh, for the whole costs. And on the other hand, we 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 consider an hybrid, a typical hybrid regulatory scheme that is the more uh, tip, uh, more used all around Europe, and I think uh, maybe uh, in most of the world, in, in most of countries, with uh, in, an incentive based regulation applied to the opex and for the capex, a typical rate of return uh, regulation. So. The model for the top tax is just like that. Uh, so we see the, the, the first two components is uh, are the component before the regulatory period. The regulatory period happens, uh, happens after T time, the time T. Um, uh, um, we, we see the, the, uh, the, 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 the third component is um, uh, alpha beta. Uh, I think that it's bit um, is the proportion of the tech uh, we see in the third component. Sorry, is uh, is the uh, where there's the action of the the, the regulator, and uh, we see the part of the, the of the decrease of the tech tax of the amount of tech tax that is uh, that will be uh, uh, that will be um, transferred to consumers and uh, will lead to uh, to the decrease of the decrease of the tariffs and the the, the last part of the the. Uh, uh, of the of this uh, of this model, Ipsan uh, Z Totex is the the proportion of the external benefits due to innovation that is retained by the company uh, in a Totex regulatory scheme. So uh, it's not uh, it's something that it can be a prime or not that uh, that regulators can give to to the to the company if there's external benefits uh, associated with the the innovative investment or the smart grid investment. Now, the hybrid model is quite similar to uh, the previous one. Uh, the difference is uh, easier in the third component where we have um, uh, in, the, in the right side uh, for the, the OPEX, uh, the, the seeds, the, 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 uh, the operational cost, uh, the part uh, uh, of the one min minus alpha e, uh, will be the, 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 the the, the amount of decrease of the, 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 the operational costs that can retain, that can keep the, the company. The other part, we, um, uh, with this gamma, etc., cetera, we, we, we see uh, it's a completely different perspective. In that case, we are in the rate of return. So the more I will invest, the more I will have revenue. So the decreasing, uh, the decrease, the possible decrease in the, um, uh, uh, the conventional investment due to the 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 the, the smart grid investment uh, will decrease my 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 revenues. So we 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 uh, we, you, we use these two models and uh, we make uh, some comparison between uh, several situations. First of all, we 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 proceed with um, uh, a situation where the regulator defines goals that are achieved by the companies. Uh, which retain part of the benefit that will be on the goals. For instance, if the regulator uh, define uh, three percent, two uh, percent each year uh, cost efficiency target to decrease the costs two percent by year, if the company decrease three percent in the, in uh, each year, the difference three percent minus two percent, uh, the one percent part of this difference, the gains can be uh, uh, can be kept by the by the the company. 
we we uh, we perform two evaluation one static where the cost structure does not change after the, the investment in smart grid and uh, a dynamic assessment where the cost structure changes um in this uh, dynamic assessment we also compare two situation uh first uh, first situation all uh, cost decrease with uh, the investment in smart grid uh, uh with the exception of the, 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 the operation and maintenance costs directly relate with the, the smart grid investment. And the other situation, all uh, only uh, uh, the cost related with uh, um, operation and maintenance investment will decrease, the others will, uh, will, uh, will increase. We also perform a case study for a situation of profit sharing between related companies and consumers. So, the results uh, those are in the paper, the, 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 the description uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, um, of the models and the result, but the, 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 the main, uh, the main uh, result that we can withdraw from the, 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 uh, the analysis is uh, if an investment in smart grid decreases network investment cost, uh, then the best option is to apply a, a Totex methodology. Uh, if an investment in smart grid does not decrease network uh, investment cost, but brings benefits that are higher than the cost they produce in the network, then hybrid regulatory scheme is more appropriate. In that case, uh, if we also have to, to address another situation, if the benefits go beyond the network, activity, it has to be weighed if only part of the, the cost in proportion of the benefit that's in the, this activity, for instance, should be recovered through tariffs if the benefits, uh, uh, for instance, uh, will be um, that go beyond the network activity uh, um, and much uh, higher than, uh, no, same the other thing, it's the benefits that stay in the, the activity are lesser uh, than the costs of the, the investment. Uh, the other situation it's uh, that we that we analyze it's uh, it was a case study for a typical case where the uh, typical case for the, the for the for this kind of uh, activities where capex has typically a bigger relative weighting than opex and the regulator is more demanding in terms of cost control for opex than for capex uh, in that case also uh, totex is uh, we conclude also that totex is more beneficial as long as investment in smart grid globally decreases the need to invest so what is the conclusion the conclusion we, we uh, resume that in that uh, that uh, uh, figure when we compare the free type of uh, uh, of uh, innovative investment with a different regulatory approach and uh, bringing back the results of the model and the analysis the previous model, uh, analysis that we have uh, done with the with the characterization of this uh, of the, the the different methodology we conclude that for the uh, uh, for substation feeder automation uh, the uh, a typical in a pure incentive based approach like uh, uh, totex is much more effective to uh, to um, to lead these uh, companies to, to to invest in this kind of uh, of uh, technologies uh, in the middle, AMI, um, it stands in the middle, lies in the middle of uh, SFI and uh, microgrid. And uh, uh, even though we can consider there's there's a lot of, uh, yes, uh, uh, AMI uh, also contribute to decrease the, the, the costs and, uh, and uh, mainly oper uh, operational costs, operational and maintenance costs. Uh, since the benefits are so, uh, so big, uh, uh, and can and go beyond the, 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 the pure cost control. Uh, it has to be performed a cost benefit analysis, and uh, maybe this can the cost of the, the of this uh, the type of investment can be uh, wall or covered through tariffs. I give the example, for instance, of the the rollover for smart meeting all around Europe that that we that we know, and uh, the, these these rollovers have been uh, performed before uh, after uh, cost benefits analysis are, have been uh, have been realized in, in, in several countries, European countries, and the conclusion uh, most of the time is uh, are that the benefits are much higher than the cost. And the benefit, there's a 
external uh, uh, there's there's external um, uh, positive externalities due to the to this kind of uh, investment so uh, the, the costs of the investment can be well uh, covered through tariffs uh, another way is to to stimulate this uh, this kind of uh, uh, of um, this type of uh, uh, investment, uh, innovative investments is to look more at an output-based regulation, not looking at the input, but to the, the looking at the 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 the, the service and the, the the and the outputs that can be provided with this type of investment. It's the it's what in Portugal, for instance, we we apply for uh, for the service uh, the service related to to the smart meters. Finally. Uh, we have microgrids, and the microgrids have to be analyzed in a case by much more in a case by case approach. It's uh, look at the, this microgrid as pro pilot project, and maybe uh, uh, define some kind of regulatory sandbox right? that is a regulatory exception to follow the, the results of these microgrids and to see if the, the gains that are achieved in the locally can be. Uh, can be reused in a more broad and a more uh, uh, for for the for the whole network. So with that slide, I finish my presentation. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vital. Any reaction? Immediate reaction? Jackie. Yeah. Thanks very much. That was interesting. So part of the um, part of the the one of the comments that I have, um, I, I, I did a similar um, AMI evaluation at, in BC, and one of, and I'm just wondering if you can give me when you did your cost benefit analysis to figure out whether that actually there was a benefit overall. Like, did you have? How did you go about doing that? Because one of the big, one of the issues we had was the biggest benefit from AMI was the reduction in electricity theft, and so there was a big debate of theft. Is that in or out of an economic reg? analysis in New Zealand it would have been out don't include it as a wealth transfer in BC it was determined it was in and then the other component was that was the utility was saying well people that were stealing it will now pay for it and will make more profit but it was on illegal illegal marijuana grow operations and so they wanted to include we'll sell more to illegal marijuana grow operations in the cost benefit analysis and in BC it said uh, no we're not going to Selling, having selling more to illegal operations is not considered an overall benefit. So, so when you go through and you you did that analysis, like how did you figure out initially whether it actually was something that should be done? And then the second part of that is when you're looking at the different regulatory me mechanisms, it's the, it's the utility managers that make decisions, not necessarily like a corporate separate from it, you know, just a corporate entity. And so one of the things we're looking at here is like bonus incentive mechanisms targeted at those decision makers, which can be quite doesn't cost as much to do. But if you try to actually incentivize the people making the decisions individually through their bonus schemes, then that can actually be based on the outcomes of let's say, if you've determined it makes sense to do AMI, then if you do it well and implement this whole project well, then you get a bonus that can actually um, be a lower cost or more effective regulatory tool. So I'd just like your, in, your, your insight on how you determined it was a benefit and then whether there's other options also from a regulatory incentive perspective. Uh, first of all, for the first question, uh, um, the cost benefit analysis wasn't well, uh, has not been uh, performed in this uh, study. Uh, the cost benefit analysis is performed by us uh, as a regulator outside the study, the, the study, the results that I've uh, that I obtained is only due, uh, with the mathematical model. So, but I can try to to answer to, to the question at the same time. For instance, uh, considering the the the, thief, the if the consumer have to pay for the losses, as in Portugal, I think that it's a regulatory uh, affair to 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 avoid this this situation and to to. To, to lead and to incent, uh, uh, to, to lead uh, utilities to invest in the uh, in the infrastructures that can avoid thief, uh, theft uh, and <laughs> energy. Um, the in uh, what uh, the second question? Sorry, I, I didn't was around. Follow. You were looking at the Totex ah, model. 
versus and yes. i was wondering whether the performance incentive measures where you actually instead of trying to incentivize based on return on rate base you just actually leapfrog through and you go straight into the managers that making the decisions and incentivize them them individually yes um what I tried to, to, to show with this, uh, this, uh, this paper is that uh, as in a, competitive en in a competitive environment, there's not a regulator that ensures the, the return. And they have to, com uh, company have to fight and to be innovative to survive. So uh, what I tried to, to show is where, where there's a space for this kind of uh, regulatory approach and what is the, the type of technologies that can be included in this regulatory approach. The other uh, approach is to have funds, to, to, to have an output-based regulation, to promote directly the innovation, is the more, is what we heard that utilities want, but at the same time, countries that uh, implement that, just like uh, England with them, et cetera, when we see the results in terms of innovation, they are not so, something missing. There's, uh, there's not so huge, there's no wow at all. So uh, the fact is, uh, there's always, we heard as regulator, it's normal that we, we are very aware of uh, the company that we regulate. And uh, I will not say that we are captured, but um, we are very sensible so for some of the, 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 the elements and arguments that they, they present. And uh, if uh, I think that the first slide is very important and the first analysis is very important. When we compare utilities and networks in general with other uh, activities, they innovate um, less than others. And um, try to, to know why and try to have a different approach for each for different type of, uh, of investment. I've, it's what we, uh, we think that will be the best approach. For instance, for the SFA, uh, if I will bore demanding in my totex, I, I know that the only answer that they can, the only answer if they want to, 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 to keep the return at the end, it's to, to, to invest in, the, in, uh, uh, in, in feeders and substation automate, uh, automation. But we know that we can't apply this aggressive, this demanding approach to all investments, so type of investment. So the, at the end, the answer is for some type of in, uh, in investments, yes, uh, what you talk about, uh, more output-based regulation, more looking at the results, of the uh, is more uh, maybe more effective when the, the the first results will not be the decrease of the cost for the utilities but when the first results is enabling the decrease of the costs due to the the the, the due to the, the the innovative investment yes maybe totex will be the the best approach yeah. thank you Maybe I have a, a question. Uh, I found it very interesting. Um, whether you might take into consideration the, the regulatory competencies, because uh, there have been many works showing that uh, applying a regulatory mechanism or, and the efficiency of the, the use of a given a regulatory mechanism also depend on the um, competencies and other characteristics of the budget and, and everything of the regulatory authorities. So I would like to know whether in your uh, modeling you take into account this internal uh, factor that impact the, the efficiency of the regulatory mechanism that uh, you compare in the trade-off. Um what we uh, the assumption is that we have a company that is 100% regulated so the, the the there's the regulator has enough empowerment to 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 uh, to ensure or not the, the the all the revenue of the company so um, it's not a situation where the, the regulator will not be able to to capture all the gains, or not will be able will not be able to uh, to define the allowed revenues. Or no, it's not this situation, of course. 
Um, uh, so it's a benevolent fact, regulator and uh, uh, sorry, no, it's a benevolent regulator with uh, no specific issues uh, of uh, internal efficiency. No, it, no, 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 okay. not, not, it's, uh, uh, it's, um, uh, no, no, we did not do, uh, we do not consider this, uh, this, it's okay. pure theoretical, theoretical, um, but at the end, what, uh, when we, uh, we, we arrive at the conclusion that it's Totex the best, uh, the, 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 the best approach, we are saying something is that, it's the only regulatory. Uh, it's the um, it's the regulatory approach that leave all the floor to the, the company. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the end, what we say it's for some kind of uh, um, some type of uh, innovative uh, uh, investment. The best is to leave the floor to them and uh, not to protect them. Uh, but uh, yes. Okay. Any other question? When sorry, when when you measure Totex, is that um, so? That'll be your capital, your operation. Do you, do you also include in there like energy efficiency incentives, uh, so that the regulator, so that the utility has incentive to promote demand side solutions under that Totex, or is that separate? it will be separate okay. so we are uh, we are in the um, i don't rem i don't know if you remember but we uh, in the model we have the last part of the model is the was the epson smart grid and this epson smart grid is all the the, the incentives that we can uh, include directly to promote the uh, uh, sign management to promote etc etc uh, the, the, the that are directly related with the externalities so and uh, this uh, but this approach can be used both for a totex approach and with the hybrid approach what i'm comparing more more in detail is if we look at uh, if we protect the investment just like the hybrid approach with the rate of return etc what uh, will we be more effective to 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 promote invest uh, innovative investment and the conclusion is for some of uh, investment when we protect investment it's constitutive but will not uh, promote uh, um, innovative investment we have to be more aggressive mm -hmm. but uh, because if they know that if we they are going to invest at the end they will avoid new investments so they will not invest in technology that at the end will not will avoid investment in the so-called copper and iron typical uh, investment. Okay. So thank you very much to all uh, participants. Thank you to Bye. Jean. <laughs> and uh, you, so I think that uh, it's time to close the session and wish you a good conference if you are able to attend another session tomorrow. Anything to add? Just a little message for the presenter. Uh, please upload your presentation in your, uh, uh, on the website, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.